Someone was describing housing as a forest to me and how you know the most recent era of housing at least here in North America has been kind of like the forestry industry where they clear cut all the forest, they plant all the same trees, they let them grow. They clear cut the forest, they plant all the same trees, they let them grow. Isn't that sanctuary that we call home, look at it as a means of profit, right? There's something inherently wrong right at the base of it, right? And even when you're building a house, people are building so often looking for it as resale value. What's its resale value, right? Instead of this is for me to replenish myself from, right? And for me to, my, it's my sanctuary, yeah. Last year, um, there was a big study that was completed and it, it, it basically studied, I don't remember, like five or 600 people um, over a long period of time. And they found that there was a, 30% increase in premature death of those people that were socially isolated. A lot of what happens in Seattle is called a sweep, which is where the police will just kick someone off of the sidewalk if they're in a tent. And there's so many people in tents that the police just spend millions of dollars kicking people off the sidewalks. There's so many different ways to talk about this. I have many different perspectives I maintain all at once. I'll tell you though, I, I, I get up in the morning, I feel like a Neolithic man who's suddenly woken up in the awakened in the early 21st century and I'm looking around at everyone being disenfranchised and feeling disempowered. Part of me is completely outraged and upset. Another part of me is like, oh my God, I, I see what's happening. Everyone, wake up, wake up. And maybe it's a political refugee camp of sorts. A lot of these people come from, for example, massive student loan debt. Ma there was a gentleman here earlier this summer that came here from the States. He, he owed over 100,000 in student loans. They took his dad's house because he co-signed the loan. In Vancouver, like the housing prices are just insane. Yeah, yeah. So no one can really buy. So a lot of people have actually turned to living in their vans or they convert something into like a mobile home that they can actually work and go home and you get to be outside more. A little bit of context. The culture that we're in that is so dystopic and characterized by increasing distress every day is predicated on the idea of the destruction of the village, which is why it is so hard to regenerate and we can't find it anywhere around us except perhaps by name. You know, what we want to do is start having our houses be what brings us together and not what separates us. Right now we have houses that kind of separate us. We're, you know, like the picket fence and the big yard and you're always at work trying to pay for the big house, but you're never there, so you can't connect to your community. So a lot of things are solved when you live smaller or in the right sized space. I built two tiny houses, uh, the Lucky Penny and T for Two, Tiny for Two and they're here in our tiny co-housing community, going places. So there are a lot of things that are really great about living together and sharing together, um, but we also have a little space of our own. And so those are always benefits of co-housing, um, but it's nice to be able to do it in tiny co-housing because we get to be really conscientious about our footprint and it's affordable. There are three in Tofino, um, but they aren't legal. So there, we have a lot of work to do in British Columbia with our building code and zoning and creating. You have to, I mean, where there's a will, there's a way, and I think we're going to get there. There's a lot of interest in living in small homes, and we have had a lot of conversations at the council table about uh, removing a limitation on minimum house sizes. So in Tofino, like many other municipalities, there's a minimum house size. If you, if you build, uh, or sorry, if you buy a piece of property, you must build a house of a certain size. Community development and kind of resident support networks are really one of the best things about this site. There's no like time limit that we require. For some people there's like a long road to housing and it just takes much longer than it does for others and for some people it's a little bit shorter or um, people just need to get housing ready so they need this place so that they can get their ID and they can get all those things that they need to get on an application and get in. Um, but again, it, it could take six months a reasonable course of six months, it could take a week. 
so we don't we don't limit that based on time um, we do have a pretty high throughput though and, and that throughput thankfully is often to permanent housing so tiny house villages are a fantastic example of what can be done to help the homeless people within your community it can help everybody and actually asking the homeless people what would best benefit them and what would best help them such as tiny house villages and a lot of people don't know about these villages quite yet would benefit them in such extreme ways to create more productive members of society so that when they actually get inside they can feel like they're actually worth something it's because my self-worth was so low when I finally got in here now that I have a key to my own place I feel so much better about myself so much better about my life because well I'm indoors now, I have the will, I have the drive, I can do it, and sometimes we just need somebody to show faith in us. We don't cost much money to run, in fact, from the city, other than the land that they're losing money off of from not having certain leaves here or whatever. That's all we're costing the city. We're paying our own dime. I've heard the argument of you can't put people in substandard housing. Well, it doesn't have to be substandard housing. Um, ours definitely, not all of them are up to our building codes, but what's the harm in coming together and having a communal shower and a communal kitchen type area? You get to know your neighbors. Well, to, to relax the regulations if it's not going to harm health or safety so that people can uh, do stuff for themselves and to, and to recognize that Affordable housing is one of the biggest problems, you know, in America or in the UK right now. So how can you, your goal is to help people who don't have a lot of money to have a place to live. And if that's the goal, then figure out what regulations can be relaxed. I mean, you, I, wouldn't re, I wouldn't relax the safety regulations or the, you know, in other words, you don't want a house to fall down. You don't want it to burn up because of bad wiring or to have the sewage overflow but so those things should be regulated but there are a lot of things that are just not uh, that just don't make any sense so how can you loosen it up and how can you <clears throat> have people you know uh, construct their own shelter you know, that's a, it's a winner winning situation for everybody so if you look at Ray's work um, it was developed because he was in his 20s, he had a lot of raw materials, but not money. And so this is a style of building um, that really keeps costs down, makes housing more affordable, more organic, and more beautiful. Well, I'm looking at at least seven stories, you know. Uh... Uh, the first, the first little unit we're gonna do is we're just gonna frame up a little two-story kind of hexagram box here, and I like this project. I, I want to work on this. I got other stuff I probably should focus on. In a landscape in which we can feel more and more minimized and marginalized as individuals and as communities, a community land trust is a main way to have that fundamental human affirmation and to move forward together to accomplish the wider dream um, for us all. This was a garage and has now been turned into affordable housing. We've got our retail spaces along the street. We have two studios here and one behind and two family units over there. There's our gas station. And then behind the community center over here, we have the Gibson House, which is the single family residence. The Bellinas Community Land Trust has their own fuel station. Non-profit organization since 1982. And, uh, by selling fuel within this quite expensive area to live, they can help subsidize the affordable housing so people can actually live there as well. Not bad. I'm a resident of the BCLT as well as uh, gonna be a cafe resident as well. So 
We're in the process of making a little acai bowl cafe, some organic salads and soups. Um, we have local farms in town here, so we get all our produce from there. And um, at the same time, the BCLT is is supporting a local kid who grew up in the town and and trying to make my own business happen within the town. And yeah, it's just a big good circle here we've got going on. So yeah, I gather the CLT structure is a little different in the United States than it is in England. Um, for a typical land trust situation in Oregon or anywhere in the country in the United States is that if you have a piece of land and you are a land trust purchaser then you buy the house that's built on the land and you get with that house that structure a 99 year lease hold interest in the property below and the land trust owns fee title to the land underneath so um, the land lease is a 99 year lease and the it has certain provisions like you have to make a nominal monthly payment to the land trust and you have to keep your house insured and stuff like that. But the main provision is a requirement that when you sell your house, whether it be in five years or, or 90 years, you have a few rules on that. And the, the rule that Portland adopted is that you can sell it for um, whatever you bought it for plus 25% of its appreciated value from the time you bought it to the time you sell it. Just, it is totally comfort. And now I'm at the age I am, and my health is not well, and I will never be thrown out of this co-op, okay? I am secure here that nobody will come and say, you get out, okay? Because I'm here until I pass. And that's the way it is with a lot of us seniors in here. So we're safe, and this, it's beautiful. I mean, just look at it. We got a special place for the kids, a playground, a green area. They can come up here. It's all. It's everywhere. We got it all. We got the whole package. The feeling that I belong. It's even in the city, and not having to be even rent burden or mortgage burden. Like that's like I've owned houses, and it's actually almost worse to own. Like you think you have security because you have animal security tenure, but if interest rates go up and mortgage changes, economic downturns happen, like all these things that put a lot of pressure so a co-op takes a lot of that off that pressure off and allows you and then because of it we have become more community oriented and I think that's that's the other thing the sense of community like you look around here these toys these things were donated by members they're maintained by members they uh, so you know there's babysitting we have community gardens we have barbecues we have all this different things in and you don't see that that often in a dense urban area and especially in apartment blocks or condos so that's the other so the second thing would be that the sense of community but it's also for again I think it this relates back to that security of tenure without without feeling safe and secure in your home you know nothing nothing else matters and once you have that feeling of stability you are able to be much stronger members of not only your immediate community but your broader neighborhood and it was always our dream to move to this co-op because um, it's so beautiful here and it's known to be like such a wonderful place that people come have children those children grow up and live here they have children that kind of thing In the U.S. And, and elsewhere as well, social isolation is becoming a really big problem. Um, and I think people that are, you know, skeptical about co-housing and why would I want that or why is that interesting to me, um, I think should be thinking about it from a health standpoint. And living in co-housing doesn't mean that you sacrifice your, your privacy or that you give it up. It means that you have a choice to be very social if you want to, and yet you can be in the privacy of your home and no one's going to be intruding in on you. Um, you could, you know, we could literally spend every single minute of the day that we're home inside our home. But for us, we're very, you know, social and when the windows are open and we hear all the activity and the, the you know, the voices and the talking and the kids downstairs, we want to see what's going on. We want to be there and we want to be involved. And, and yet there are times when we come home from work and we're exhausted, we'll come and have a community dinner. And sometimes I might just sit there and not talk, but I feel like I'm being recharged by the people around me. And then I might eat and just come upstairs and, you know, chill out and do something else. People come here for any number of reasons. Um, you know, it's the lowest price housing in Marin. That's one reason. It's the ambience of living on the water. That's a big reason. But the reason people stay here is because of the community. The community is a, a very, it's a very special place. So I pay $900 
um, which sounds like a lot for 200 square feet and it kind of is but I mean to to live in this space and now that the Bay Area the rents are like exorbitant out of control I I feel lucky so um, you know my my roof leaks in the winter and I think that's why my rent has not gone up <laughs> you know so I'm on a boat the community's amazing like I don't ever want to leave you know so yeah I mean I I'm very grateful and, and I'm very lucky that I landed this spot yeah sometimes you have to plan like a half an hour to get to the parking lot because you'll end up particularly in a weekend you'll end up talking to everybody on the way or like you did you'll get interrupted by a dock alert which is issaquah ease for a party this is my kitchen oh. so i have a hot plate a convection oven blender juicer my fridge is under um my fridge is under the stairs there so it's very tiny but it's perfect for one i love it we had humming toadfish here a week ago, and the whole house was vibrating with these, the plain fin midshipman is the proper name, but the humming toadfish humming underneath the house. And, I mean, where else can you get that kind of first-hand experience with nature? I've been coming here since 1994, after the Clockwood Sound protests of 93. A bunch of friends and I uh, kind of wandered in this part. They built the boardwalks. And the place started to gather steam more and more. Uh, this last couple of years, it's really gathered steam. About four years ago, we formed a nonprofit society here called the Tofino Habitat Society. Put together a board of directors and started creating some structure to manage it. And uh, we created a mandate to house uh, temporary and transient humans that wander in and protect the habitat that we're on. Because you're, you're way more in tune with what's going on around you because you're not just sitting in a house all the time, you're out in nature and bugs come in, birds, you know, I had hummingbirds actually not lo that long ago, I had three within a week come into my van and fly in front of my face and hover there and just, yeah, had some really, really good, good moments. Jackson and I have been just been sitting here talking about the idea that, you know, it, that a tiny home or an affordable little place to live, if, you know, if we get a bunch of them all lined up together, but everyone's still in isolation, then we still only have the parts. But in order to get to a whole greater than the sum of the parts, we need to be thinking about how these things all kind of coalesce together into a village. The ultimate design strategy is the guild, where you set down your roots and you look for ways for everyone else to be complementary and find how they will optimize and contribute best. In the guild, we all become stronger by looking for ways for other people to become as strong as possible, and together we thrive. That's just permaculture for you, and uh, the application of permaculture in the urban environment, of course, offers us the opportunity to build community with absolutely everything that we do. I would say that there is a space for policymakers and for foundations to invest in the development of organizations. So you can have a bunch of committed people and you say, well, uh, they're not an organization yet or they've only done one little project and so we need to therefore give our public dollars to a larger organization with greater capacity and much more maneuvering room and a huge bottom line. There is an ethic of investment and of developing your community partners to the place that they need to be to um, be in teamwork with you so that you create uh, uh, what you as a government entity are responsible for and what communities dream for. But really a forest thrives when you have oak trees and then you have cedar trees and you have fern trees or fern plants. You have all these different kinds of plants and different kinds of trees and that's what makes a thriving forest. And so when it comes to housing, um, you know, having different models of housing is what makes us thrive as a community. So you've got your standard single family home, you've got your condos, you also have collective housing, you have tiny housing, you have co-op housing, you have all these different models and they're not competing with each other. It's not what one model is better than the other, it's that they all coexist together and then they can thrive like a forest. It's 
that ability to create a space, to design and then to build and to have something that is the manifestation of a dream and something that's on a small enough scale that you can actually do it. You can dream it up, you can make it happen, and then you get to inhabit the structure that you created, the sculpture that you made all on your own with the help of a bunch of friends.